those of you who are, you know, second year, third year, fourth year, even even fifth year, um, just some some general guidelines. Um, you know, keep keep promotion and tenure in the back of your mind generally, but really start planning a year or more out. I think it's excellent to have this platform and this group of folks and other groups um, that are working. Um, definitely be using events to help build your network and connect with potential letter writers. I want to say a couple of things about your external reviewers or your external letter writers today. Um, I use the ACSP conference to stay in touch with folks and seek out people for coffee, like when I needed advice um, for, to kind of create relationships with people who might serve as letter writers down the road. Some universities are very open about allowing you to cultivate relationships with potential letter writers and others are not. So do find out what you need to do within the culture of your own school. Um, you know, make sure, um, I think, you know, early in the process, if, if you are doing um, extra service, see if your service can be acknowledged in your profile by changing your profile percentage. Um, think about ways that you are connecting service and research. You know, if you are an action research person, be thinking about how to narrate that to, to other people, the people who are making decisions about you and your department and beyond. Um, make sure you have some mentors from outside your own school and department. And I think for those of you who've just done your third year review or people who are going into it, start using any annual review process or especially your P&T check-ins to craft and test um, writing, like descriptions of yourself um, with other people as they're reviewing. So for example, I think April and I talked about this a little bit last time, and sorry, I have animals that will cruise through every once in a while. Um, because I was very much perceived as different than my more social science colleagues, what I started to do was to actively, come on, was to actively write about the role and the importance of other types of writing in my subfield and for my, and for my particular research. So for me, book chapters are important and useful and where I have, have done a lot of my writing. So I started talking about book chapters. I started narrating that that was the relevant place for me to be doing my work. And I kept putting that language in my annual review documents and in my third year review so that by the time it got to my tenure, um, to my actual tenure review, the people in my department that were reviewing me who were critical that I didn't have more peer-reviewed articles had were seeing language that they'd been seeing about me for a few years in a row, if, if that made sense. Um, so, and then, you know, we are, you know, we are the people that are most able to narrate our own work. And, and so you want to create, you want to, you know, claim your narrative and continue to nurture it and just keep putting out there what you're doing and the fact that you're doing it well and how it is affecting or changing the world around you and the communities that you are working in. Um, you are one of your very best messengers and, you know, you just, you need to just occupy that space for yourself and and continue to inform people make that space for yourself and draw in mentors and colleagues and friends to help support you in that um, just a couple of practical things that started to come up last time we talked um, this was my experience once you once you've completed your statement probably for your external review first before the internal review happens within your your university you don't really make changes to your statement after that the only thing I updated were um, when I wanted to like citation counts. That was the only thing that changed in my um, statement. I updated my CV though. Um, I was asked to. I updated my CV every time a different level of review started. So external review happened for me with the letter writers in the summer, last summer. 
my first internal review went in in the fall and that was department through college and then there was one final update allowed before things went to the provost at the beginning of this year um, and one other thing you know don't be afraid to write about or contextualize extenuating circumstances or things that you think fall outside the norm um, but definitely workshop those things with mentors and friends and in groups like this as um, as you are moving forward. Um, I can show you an example of that if there's time. Now there are some questions about letter writers and, and how to be strategic with them. My The two universities I've worked at have been very, very different in terms of how they handled the letter writer selection process. So I'm just going to talk about my most recent experience. Um, I did not go up for tenure at USC. That was my, my first institution, but I was aware of the process. Um, think about um, you want you are able to recommend a certain number of reviewers to the pool. Um, and then your committee or whoever's working with you um, for your tenure process, they need to be able to recommend a certain set of reviewers as well, whose names they have not heard from you. So, so think about um, people that are out there in the field that your peers might think of as having the ability to comment on your work. Um, try to leave some of those folks alone for your committee to figure out that they should ask them. If there are any informal challenge or channels that allow you to talk a little bit about who's on your list or who's off, it's okay to have a little bit of conversation about that, but just it needs to be a very discreet conversation. And then I would suggest with the names you recommend yourself, think about people who you know would do an excellent job of speaking to your abilities and your contribution um, to the field. And, um, and that might not be people that your committee would think of. Um, so you're, there's a little bit of a balance. Um, sometimes colleagues are helpful in terms of uh, indicating who might be on your external list, not, not breaking confidentiality, but just talking about yeah, you have this wish list of 10 people. Don't worry, several of those folks are on our radar. So there may be some people who will give you some hints that way. Um, and just a, a last few, you know, kind of general notes. Like I said, nobody can write more passionately about your work than you can, but it is really hard, I think, to make claims about significance. Um, it feels like boasting. Um, statements can be challenging because there's a lot of I statements in there, but if you're having trouble um, talking about how much of a badass you are, have friends and mentors help you think about how to put your work out there and how to narrate what you're doing. Um, you know, and, and just try to make sure you've got multiple folks looking at the statement. Um, Create a narrative that is simple and compelling. This is not unlike uh, uh, like the audience for a master's thesis. You're gonna have people who are knowledgeable, very educated reading, but they are not gonna be, they might not be a part of planning. They might not know much about planning at all. So be simple and clear with your narrative and then use detail in you know, your action research, in your teaching, in your service work that supports the depth and significance in the areas where you do work. Um, and then as we know, the outside letters are important. So, you know, for those of us working in community engaged work, um, it's helpful to kind of come up with what I call a tagline or just what's your one word thing about what you do? Here are three examples. Um, uh, my, my good friend Jane, who would be happy to do um, a session with everybody, um, I just talked to her last week. So she, she identifies as an activist scholar. So she's very much, um, you know, I think what um, Andrea um, 
was just talking about in terms of this misinterpretation of research as service, I think Jane did a really good job of negotiating that exact, that exact issue. And I know that she is willing to share her statement with folks. And I know that she'd be happy to do a session like this in the future. So, so she calls herself um, an activist scholar. She is, you know, she's at a land grant school. She's doing on the ground, community engaged um, studio work. She was able to successfully renegotiate her profile to include more teaching and, and more service work to help recognize kind of that, that complex that complex body of work that emerges sometimes, right, when we're doing work engaged with the community. So, um, so that this is her opening paragraph from her successful statement. She just got tenure a year ago. Um, Dr. Rago Kraft um, defines herself as a social justice scholar and practitioner. Um, I think that's another really good, concise tagline. Um, what you see below is actually a, a full bio, right? So she's she's giving her, um, you know, her research, her calling, and then something interesting about herself because she was a, a guest blogger on The Professor is In last week. Um, you know, I choose to use community engaged scholar. And like I said, I'm a designer. Um, so I talk a little bit about um, what that means to me, how I define urban design, what I think the crucial issues are in urban design moving forward. Um, so I will upload that up, this updated document too. And, and this was just to give you, again, this is overview. Um, this is my statement or my career narrative. Uh, introduction okay there's a cover page for me on both my cv and my statement so just so you know page one is is literally just the title of the document table of contents and i was asked to do that by my college so that that's a format thing but just a couple of things i wanted to point out this is just how it came together for me but i collected some bits and pieces of advice so i have my introduction I have what is called a statement of substantial success. And that's just where you summarize and like dump everything you can, th all of the great stuff that you can think of that helps explain you comprehensively. Like, you know, like I've done this many peer reviewed, you know, presentations. I've published these many book chapters. I have worked on these many projects with communities. Um, what you want to do those within the first two pages of your statement maybe if you are limited to a very short statement or a series of short statements you keep it to one page but get everything out that's going to let the external reviewers especially make a decision about your case within the first couple of pages and then in the remainder of your statement you can be laying out more specifics and the detail that they can go to to understand you better and to find things that they might want to quote in their letter. But that was a specific piece of advice I got, and I think it can be very helpful because it's an exercise in making you have to um, just put yourself out there and really summarize and really lift up your experience. Um, so after that, um, I did a research overview, and if you're gonna talk about different categories of research, um, that you are engaged in, and for me, it's it's about public space and in in conflict um, environments, transportation, urbanism, and something I call designing just futures. I made sure that by the bottom of the second full page of text, not only had they seen my substantial success summary as I defined it, they'd also seen the introductory paragraph to my overview. So within those two pages, they had a pretty good sense of me. Then I laid all of that information out, the specific projects, and I went publication by publication. I'm, I'm pretty much a solo, solo scholar. Um, almost all of my teaching and service is very collaborative, but my actual writing has been mostly me, um, although that's changing now, but that was a trajectory I started off on early. 
Um, so I don't have a huge list of publications. Um, and so it was really important to list every single thing I had done, but put it in context and provide the significance of, you know, what I was attempting to do, what I was trying to contribute to the field at the time that I was working on reporting, you know, an experience or research. Um, and I just, you know, kind of, I went through with that um, and then all the way through teaching and service and then a short future directions um, piece. CV contents, uh, many of you probably saw this already. The only, the only thing I wanted to call out that might be a little bit different from how some people are handling it, we talked a little bit last time. Um, folks, do you look for an overview timeline where you kind of explain in one way or another what you've been doing ever since you got your PhD? And, and that comes up in, kind of your employment record. And so that's your academic positions and, and all other employment or other things you were doing. That's, that's the summary snapshot. Um, but there's creative ways to, to navigate that. I think if you feel like you've got a gap in your CV, there, there are ways to work on, on, on handling that. Um, also, I, I put awards with my academic positions. Um, partly because the awards were distanced kind of in years because of working at two different universities and getting established at a new university. So I don't have a separate awards section. Um, that wasn't something that I had a lot of. I didn't need to call those out. Um, where I did spend a little bit more time and kind of have a separate section is, you know, with, with scholarships and grants and, and things like that, calling that out separate. So um, so basically, education, employment, scholarship and research, um, professional practice, teaching, um, and service. And, you know, use, basically create subcategories in ways that, that strengthen um, your case and, and illuminate your case and just eliminate um, you know, eliminate uh, subtitles and things where they where they don't um, support you. There is a loose structure that we need to um, follow, but it is not um, it is not set in stone. You know, there's there's a framework to follow, but you you have I think more creativity sometimes than we think, some more ability to express your own particular career um, in a way that makes sense to you and to others. Um, a, a couple of, just a couple of other things. Um, this took me a long time to get concrete answers to. So I just, I wanna share it with you just in case. Um, I ended up, so I did online um, PDF copies of all research and teaching examples. And, and Aide is, is very close to submitting too. So she can, I'm sure she can chime in too with how she's handling it. So external and internal reviewers, um, I got firewall kind of separated from that material and external and internal reviewers used my digital files um, to look at my work. But to boost visibility in my internal review, I did create one file box of tenure materials that were primarily used by review in my, first by my committee, then by my department, and then by my college council, and finally by my dean. So those never left the building, but they were available and they're just kind of tangible pieces of, of my work that, that people could see if they wanted that reassurance. And again, that was partly navigating some of the, the older, some of my older, more senior colleagues who were more comfortable with hard copy materials and really wanted to see the article in the journal or see the chapter in the book. And then it was also for the convenience of distanced external reviewers and people who are, are content and comfortable reviewing online. So that's, that's how we got that split. Um, I just use a simple file box with dividers. I had heard crazy stories about people ordering special folders from Germany and, you know, all sorts of silly things. It really was straightforward. The work just is going to speak for itself. Um, so, you know, and one, just one other quick thing, um, 
you know, I listed in my CV, I follow, you know, I follow kind of the norm of listing the peer review work first. Um, but as I said, I'm a little bit less of a traditional social scientist than many of the people in my department. And I was hired kind of in a hybrid position, somebody who teaches and engages in a lot of community design work. And so they hired me as a designer in a planning school. And so while I followed the convention in the CV to aid in readability in the statement, I flipped what I talked about first to emphasize the things where I had put in the majority of my time and attention. Um, so think about, you know, you can use your CV in one way and you can use your statement in another way to help support telling your story. And this is all about, it. it's to a certain extent about the impact that you have had already, but in essence, it is almost entirely about your trajectory and the fact that they can see that you have that you have a voice in scholarship and you are going to get tenure and you are going to continue to do that. So you are illustrating, you are supporting your trajectory and you are indicating that that is going to continue and only in, you know, improve and your voice and your impact are going to continue to grow over time. So just, it, it doesn't have to be a done deal. You just, you want to do a very good job of illustrating that you are in process. Okay. Um, I know going through those general notes took a little bit of time. Evis, we could, I could also, I could share a bit of my statement and just make a few points and we could start doing some Q&A if there are questions. Or I could just share that this statement later if people want to take a look at it on their own time. Yeah, I think that we can um, probably do questions. Okay. And then um, we can have like questions that will be recorded and then later later on stop it. So. Okay. That sounds good. And, and um, I know most of what I've said so far is fairly general. Um, and I guess part of that's coming, like I said at the beginning, coming from the point of view where I feel like if you're doing community engaged work or you are an activist scholar, um, that you are, you are having to prove yourself extra in in the traditional kind of in the traditional academy so i know some of what the some of the things i said were pretty general um but this is about i think different tactics um to help ensure your success as you go through the process right any any questions i will stop sharing for the moment um yes pg um Hi, um, so you had mentioned that there were um, kind of creative ways to um, describe gaps or, you know, low teaching loads or something like that. And I was just curious if you could elaborate on that. Sure, I think, well, one of the best things is, one of the best general moves, I think, is to get to know who in your department or who in your college is providing mentorship or going to be looking at and reviewing your work down the road and start finding out about how you need to narrate yourself vis-a-vis -vis the, the culture of your particular, your particular university. Um, Cause I find that it's very different. So, um, and you, you don't want to insist on doing something that, that they, you know, that format wise doesn't work with how they review 95% of the cases in your department. Um, I would say, you know, if you are, if you are concerned about gaps, um, one, maybe, you know, maybe you separate out, um, like either maybe you create a more combined hybrid set of employment and activities Right, so you're filling, you're showing what you're doing all the way through, whether it's a traditional teaching job or not. So that's, you know, so maybe it's a kind of a lumping rather than a splitting. You just make that richer, a richer reporting of your timeline. Um, another way might be to separate out like specific, you know, teaching or academic jobs that you've done. And like, you know, like for me, I had all of my academic positions in, 
in one space and then but I did show other employment including you know when I was working as a volunteer in community design and development um, so I don't know if that helps AG but just think about you know one you got to fit the culture of the people who are going to review you Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, you, you want them to understand you, but I think when we are also doing community engaged work, we are also trying to break the mold. And so we want to be giving them some framework that they can understand where we're coming from. But then you also want to take the language further and be educating them like this is what I'm doing and this is why it's important and here's how it impacts planning or here's how it helps people in my community. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank sure. You. Okay. So I, I had a question about the reviewers because like first yeah. I was like planning to just use like planning scholars. Um, mm -hmm. But I do a lot of like things in Puerto Rican studies too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I worry about no, maybe not adding uh, reviewers um, that don't do that because the way that it would be like perceived. And you can see it the same way if you do like if you're a feminist scholar or if you right. do community engagement. So I don't know if you had any advice regarding that. I think, um, and I think, um, I know Nicola isn't with us today, um, but I think, you know, she was worried about translating out of her department and college to the university. And it's, you use your letter writers to help convey the significance and importance of the work you're doing. So Evis, I think that's a really good question. I think on the set of, of reviewers that you get to recommend, I think I would think about doing some folks, maybe or recommending some folks if there's somebody, you know, if there's somebody or some buddies who could help span you know, different parts of, of your work and interest to talk about them collectively, or say the primary lens is planning, but then it's, you know, area studies or it's of, of different types or feminist critique. You want, you want to try to recommend some people that you know can speak sympathetically and knowledgeably about the, the full you. And I think, you know, if, if you have a tenure committee that's being assembled to, to take, to take your, you and, and your material through your department and maybe through your school, and that's a pretty typical setup, they are going to be looking to, they're going to be looking to people in the field and people they know, like they're going to be drawing on their own peer networks. Um, slightly different but related if you get asked if, if, if you get an opportunity to comment on who will be on your tenure committee or you might need to insist that you have a right to talk about who's on your committee or not be sure that you have somebody on there who understands you like understands you from a, a field or discipline point of view so I for example my committee was three people um the the chair uh the chair was an urban design faculty member but who works in a different part you know kind of different area of the world different focus than me but could speak to urban design in urban planning and then i had a colleague who was a planner who really focuses on democratic process and then I had a third member from our landscape architecture department because I have an affiliate appointment there. And so that was a second design voice that could help narrate me as a designer in a planning school and me as a designer teaching planning. I'm also trained as a planner, but I was hired as a designer to teach, you know, in planning. So it really helped to have a couple of folks who understand design on the committee. So before even your shaping part of the external review list and their shaping part of the external review list of which you don't ever know exactly who was on their list, um, you get you get better understanding because they will draw on their personal networks as they seek reviewers. Um, I had five 
five reviewers in the end. I think sometimes they, they will ask an initial five. They often do it over the summer when they, they hope people aren't quite as busy and they'll ask those letters usually to be due before your school year starts. Um, and, and that's just the starting, you know, that's kind of the kickoff of the whole thing. Um, I have a follow-up question on that. So I've yeah. kind of heard mixed things on Mm -hmm. the extent to which you should vocalize mm -hmm. um like if so I guess one of the questions yeah. I have is if there's people that are sort of look like they're obvious choices I've heard mixed mm -hmm. things about whether or not you should put them on your list um like I don't know I'm still trying to figure out how this works in terms of yeah if you need to be strategic about mm -hmm. the way you know like this is the honest three however many people that you get to pick and this is who they pick and hopefully I think in a perfect world that seems to work out well but I've heard other people say that you know because they're on your list if it's an obvious choice maybe don't put them because mm -hmm. then if it's so obvious that might have been the person that they were going to choose and now right. that you put them you kind of x them I, I don't know I just right I might no. be too far into it but I've just heard both yeah. sides of it 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 can be it it can really mess with your mind and it's a really it's a really good question and yes you do want to be careful with some of those that might be obvious choices you you don't want to you maybe don't want to bring them up because you want to let your committee invite them to be letter writers because once you have uttered their names out loud officially they are on your list and and so i think for me, out of five letter writers total, I think two came from my suggestions and three came from the committee's ideas. And so, yes, yeah, so, so some of those, ob like the obvious people, like there's a senior planning scholar whose work you really love and have been using in your own work. Maybe you just, you let them, you let your committee figure that out. And then, and then you put forward some of the, maybe the more like, you know, like people who rep represent or can kind of speak to your, your synthetic work, like the synthetic you, you know, like your community engagement, activism, what you're contributing to the planning canon. So like, think about, yeah, your, your list is a way to elevate people who, you know, I'm not saying that they're going to be biased and on your side, but to speak, you know, your list gives you the opportunity to bring people into the conversation who you know can be set up to speak to, to you and your work. Yeah. Now, there, there is something that happens sometimes where there is a little bit of informal discussion um, sometimes between somebody who's going up for P and T and maybe um, a tenure committee chair, where there might be a little informal conversation outside of the building about, hey, we're building your list. Who are you thinking about having on your list? And maybe you say some of those names. But that is something that is something to do carefully. Um, you know, um, University of Washington's promotion and tenure guidelines, I would say are relatively explicit and clear, not opaque. The process is outlined. There's given, you know, there's like, there's, you do this work, you get a response, you get to write a letter, like the whole process is very laid out. And where I came from, the tenure process was pretty opaque and it felt like the targets shifted and you, you weren't even supposed to think about your letter writers when you were in the building. You weren't supposed to ever really have a conversation about them. So the culture, um, the culture can be quite different institution to institution. Mm -hmm. I think I have a brief follow-up question. Um, I think yeah. it's similar to Evis's around letter writers. Um, our system is a bit different. It's completely mm -hmm. open and collaborative. Um, mm -hmm. And we all sit on the tenure committee. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've been sort of workshopping potential letter writers for probably mm -hmm. since year two. Um, so I have 10 potential but my two areas are pretty divergent, right? One is really around, you know, sort of community engaged. 
work um, with mixed income, you know, communities mm -hmm. around the built environment, and then this entire other body of work that's more related to right diversity, cultural competency, engaging communities of color, mm -hmm. but also within institutions, right? Mm -hmm. And so among this list, when I think about those potential people for letter writers, there's maybe one person, right, that could mm -hmm. speak to both, right? Mm -hmm. Where everyone else is really focused purely like on content, you know? But I guess what I'm worried about is that for those that might be like really, you know, sort of housing folks won't necessarily mm -hmm. understand the race-based work and the importance of that. Um, yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how to think about letter writers when you have, I think, quite di divergent areas that you're working in, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm a designer and then I'm a planner, right? You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it can help um, a, a couple of things. Like, you know, it's it's totally legitimate, right, to have two different areas of of research and engagement and, and interests that you care about, right? And those are just maybe two things that exist for you that are part of your career. Um, one, one thing that I think can be helpful, well, and let me say before, I, I don't think that a letter, you know, every letter writer doesn't need to necessarily speak to those two different parts of your professional and personal life, right? The letter writers overall are going to be providing evidence that shows that you are qualified by both of your, your work areas to move forward and receive promotion and tenure. So I think that's okay. And then I, you know, I think it can help when you talk about who you are at the beginning of your statement. And I do think, I think it's great that you have a collaborative process there. But, you know, when you talk about yourself and who you are at the beginning of your statement, maybe talk about how for you those two areas matter and how you see them relating to one another. And does one support the other? And does one provide questions for the other? And, and then in your, in your future directions, you can talk about what you might want to be doing in those two, I'm just going to call them two different tracks for now, but what do you want to do moving forward in those two tracks? And are there some future opportunities for crossover? And, and then, you know, your letter writers are going to have their specific expertise, but if you've narrated for them in your statement how you understand those two things to be significant and maybe to be combined in your life, they can also understand that and narrate that to the provost and to the president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Really helpful. Sure. Betsy, I think you're muted. Oh. Yeah. I also wanted to see, like, we can also stop the recording for other types of questions. Yeah. So I, I will sure. now. I just, just let me know. Um, I'm working off of one little screen, so um, maybe just um, put, um, let's see, there we go. Oh, I got it. I see it. Okay. Just uh, give a shout out. So, okay. So, like I said, um, again, so Betsy, this is part, it, this is, you know, this is, working within the system, but trying to share the information, which is one step, but it's one very small step in a system that is, is medieval and, I know, I know. I'm yeah, just... and, and broken. And I totally, I get what you, I, I, I get what you're saying. And I think us being here and Eva's helping to get us all here, I think is a really important step forward because the, the you know, and there's still parts of this that were so black box to me is just, it's crazy, um, you know, and, and yeah, anyway. <laughs> so um, I was asked to have a cover sheet and this was part of the culture of my institution, okay. Um, and so then I ended, I had my content. So people, you wanna make it as easy as possible for people reviewing you uh, to find what they need to find. And this isn't really any different than, you know, when we advise our, our thesis students right, to, to do certain things. So here's another weird thing. This was another cultural thing. Um, we, we started by citing the policy directory um, that talks about substantial success in teaching and service, okay? And so um, this was the thing ultimately that you're trying to prove 
in my university as you are becoming, as you are applying to become an associate professor. Substantial success in teaching and research. Um, because I had come from another university, I always had to kind of think about how to acknowledge that without spending too much time on it. And Betsy, I know that might be the case for you as you are writing yours. So I'll try to point out things that I think can be helpful and then you can use this to, to whatever extent it's helpful for you. Um, so, you know, I'll mention that um, we typically narrated kind of where we were. I went up a year early, technically, but since my tenure clock had been reset completely, I, I wasn't truly early. Um, I also, um, I did a lot of service work at my previous university, so I had to think about ways to describe what I was doing and why I might have fewer publications than some people might expect me to. Okay. So like I was, I was, I served as chair of my department as a tenure track faculty member. And I was asked by people who had votes on my tenure and I didn't feel like I could say no. So I did it. I applied for one year, a one year clock extension. I was given two. Um, and and so you know you have to and this is where i was saying you can talk about extenuating circumstances but you want to workshop them and it's exhausting to play the strategy game but it's better to play it and then be in a position to help dismantle it than to not play it i think so and here's just where i went into that initial substantial success i borrowed this language directly from a male colleague because he was he was my chair and he's like you don't have a strong enough statement about what you are doing and and how you are doing it so talking about being an expert in community focused design and planning an original observer and analyst bullet it's okay to do bullet points it's okay to underline it's okay to do bold um, talk about reputation to date is based on things all the way research teaching service call out the points that are important talk about the fact that the press where i published my book is another indication of success um, here's some language around chapters and non strictly peer-reviewed writing i mean it's peer you know it's peer-reviewed in the in the sense that um, if it's part of a series it goes through peer review it's peer reviewed in the sense you got invited um, but it's different than publishing in a journal, right? And so you you want to elevate the language of um, of invitation around that. You can summarize money that you've raised to date. Um, it's helpful sometimes to talk about, you know, if if like me, I was trying to make the case as a solo scholar at the time, though that's starting to change. So I really wanted to em I wanted to emphasize that my, you know, my writing record was just me and that um, most of the money was just me or that I had a leadership role on the grant. Um, so this is really this is page two. Um, I do briefly mention teaching. I do briefly mention service. Um, and then, like I said, by the time I to the end of my second page, I've given my research overview and the three areas that I'm going to talk about in depth. So they've gotten the snapshot in the first two pages. This was a, this was something, and this was kind of what I was talking about when I tried to answer April's question. Um, I talked about kind of who I am and then sometimes you might want to include how you define yourself and for yourself the field or the subdiscipline that you're working in. So I was asked, basically I was told that I would be most successful going through tenure as a designer, just as a designer in urban planning. So that's how we that's how I narrated my annual review statements. That's how I started to develop this stuff. So I and you know, and I'm calling urban design a subdiscipline of urban planning. Some people would believe that and some people wouldn't. Most urban design programs um, come out of architecture or landscape architecture programs, but primarily architecture. So um, 
so and this this just worked out that at the very top of the next page they get to see some of the things that are meaningful for me in terms of invitation and imagine publics in terms of my public space work and and then i finish writing about my overview by before i get to the end of that page and then i go into research program and here's and and this is something that switched at the last minute for me and it was very stressful i had previously narrated my statement um, chronologically and i hadn't gotten feedback from my associate chair who was supposed to be the the inside person the inside pnt person who was available to help me kept flaking on me and he looked at my earlier version of the statement very close to the time that I had to go to the external letter writers and he's like this will not work this is not strong enough you need to go piece by piece and you need to tell people why each thing you've done is important so this was kind of a last minute switch it did make it stronger um but it also created um it also created some stress and confusion <laughs> and it created a bobble one apparently one of my five so uh, all of my five re external review letters were positive and recommended promotion and tenure which i'm grateful for um one said said it looks you know kind of like it looks like rachel's trying to be a critical theorist and if that's the case then i wouldn't recommend promotion and tenure but if she's really going up as an urban design scholar yeah sure I, you know she's got the work for it and i'm not trying to be a critical theorist but i think some of the big questions about cities and how we occupy and use cities and who has the right to the city are questions that need to be you know part of our empirical our empirical work our community engaged studios etc cetera, etc cetera. and so i'm like no that's that's really a misunderstanding of me but when i sat down with my dean to review her letter before she sent it to the provost she brought it up too so that bobble continues to follow me a little bit and my dean just said she's like you've got kind of this domestic social you know mobility social justice work going but you've also opened up the door for criticism in terms of you know critical theory you need to she's like now that you're going to become an associate professor you have to decide which way you're going and you have to do you know you have to do it well and um, i'm still working my way through some of the advice i've been hearing back kind of the after effects of this case and i haven't made a final decision about what i think i should be doing or not but it's it's interesting how you know the person who was supposed to review this early on and it's not his fault it's my statement it's ultimately my responsibility but that person is a critical theorist and i'm wondering if my stuff had been reviewed a little bit earlier after i made the switch in the statement if maybe we would have avoided the bobble um, but the bobble gets talked about every time i get reviewed now so um but anyway it's it's there um so just a couple of things I want to point out um, here. You know, like I said, I think it's helpful to define your subfield from your point of view and how it makes sense to you and your work. Um, if you do like something that's part of a special session and, and there are, you know, people that you can call out like Ananya and Gavin, um, were the ones that organized a session that became a special issue that I participated in. It's okay to put that kind of stuff out there. It's helpful to be thinking about just, you know. And that's in planning theory. Thank you very much. It is. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but apparently, I'm not. I'm. I think I'm too much for them. I was too much of a dilettante. I'm like, I don't want to be a critical theorist. I just want to pose the big questions to the empirical daily work we do. Um, you know, think think about you know if you're writing about your own stuff, like I con you know I consider, I contrast, I prove, I present, and you get tired talking about yourself. And if it's collective work, either we did this, we are showing the way forward on this, or we did this, and my specific piece was. So just you can even have just like a little card by your computer just 
pick a different phrase every time you need to talk about yourself and, and what you're doing. And like I said before, have friends and colleagues read because we are much better at standing up for each other than we are for ourselves, I think. It's much easier to write, to, to help other people be strong in their writing. Um, let's see, a couple of other things I just wanted to point out. You know, I think too, let me just go back to one thing. You know, if, if you're really inspired by people's work, it's okay to include a little bit of a reference to that. Um, I, you know, I said my approach is primarily inductive and community focused. And I just, I use some of, you know, Haraway's like, you know, knowledge is plural, it's specific. For me, it's very inductive. I, it's okay to help people understand you through the lens of somebody's work that helps, you know, it's, it's okay to use other people a little bit to frame, you know, and I also talk in the next paragraph that, you know, everyday urbanism, the right to the city matter quite a bit to me is like foundational concepts. Um, you know, and then here, you know, like I said here, it's like, these are the three buckets. I start with the most, the one where I've had the most success and the most work. This is the line that comes directly from my, all of my PhD work in, in Bogota. Um, I started working in Latin America about 18 years ago at this point. Um, you know, and so it, here I'm just, I'm highlighting specific pieces. I don't have a ton of them, so I'm actually throwing them in people's faces and talking about the significance. I, I do, however, have a monograph out of this line of my research. So, and here, here's the, here's the citation note um, at the time. So just talking about, because the majority of my citations right now are around my work in Bogota, um, across the dissertation itself, uh, a book chapter, a book, two articles. So you could talk about it collectively. And that's, this is the only piece of the statement that I updated after the final draft was complete. They don't want that to change typically. Um, you know, and, and so I bring, I narrate people through what I was trying to do with each of those pieces that I kind of did one at a time. Um, and I was able to, to link what I was doing as a response to splintering urbanism and to talk a little bit about that. So I tried to position myself. You're like, you're not locking yourself in, but you can position yourself a bit. And, and then um, I, just because I had heard from people at various ACSP conferences who were using my work, I was able to, um, I was able to just have a little side note. Some people didn't like me having this, but I kept it anyway. Like if you know your work's being used somewhere, go ahead and let people know. You know, it's helpful when it's Diane Davis or Enrique. And obviously Ananya now, you know, has been at UCLA for several years now, but she was one of my, she was on my dissertation committee and one of my advisors at Berkeley. So, um, and then, you know, you kind of, I brought my, in my statement, in my research areas, I brought people up to the contemporary moment. So even if I had taken a break and started publishing in a different kind of sub area of my interest, I brought people up to the present time. And then I just transitioned to my other two buckets, which are a little bit smaller, um, but do inform a lot of the teaching work I've done and, and actually um, so this was kind of the, the mobility work that came out of Bogota, an edited volume that I did, the essay that I did at the beginning of that book. And then um, I had been doing, because I do do some illustration work and have done a lot of teaching and some, some other work around data viz, um, I was able to kind of show a third bucket of things. And this is a little bit of my catch-all book though it has a catch-all bucket though it has really particular intent and I'm very interested in continuing to move forward with this I was some things that I hadn't been narrating in my statement that were part of kind of my earlier life as a landscape architecture faculty member at a different university I was able to bring in 
when I had a, a large enough bucket title to kind of let me place things in that area. So talking about, again, the newest work, um, current, current work that I'm now involved in with the Nehemiah Initiative, I'll talk about in the ABCD conference later this week. Um, then teaching statement. And I feel like, you know, University of Washington, they care that you're, you know, they don't want you to be a terrible teacher, but they just need you to be a good teacher. And, and really, a lot of times you're, you're having to narrate, you, you're always narrating your research more, you're always narrating it first. Um, you know, so definitely, I think, you know, my teaching and service, I've laid things out fine, enough for people to understand. Um, you know, service, a lot of my focus has been on curriculum. I have a particular interest in pedagogy and, and, and the experience of students in their classes. The very end, like I, you know, that whole, that whole piece on service, there's one tiny paragraph at the end on my previous institution. So it's nice to have it in there, but you don't want to make it the focus. And then the last piece, future directions. Um, I come back to and reuse a couple of terms that I use to define my work and my what I'm passionate about. I use them again here. And this is a pretty short piece, just those three paragraphs. And I felt like things were pretty long. I was told that my, my statement was long. Um, but I did as much as I could format wise to help it read um, as clearly as possible. Like, like, you know, kind of not even a full double hard return between paragraphs, everything single space, use the indent to help the eye. Um, you know, I think when you're writing about community, um, there's a lot to say. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving pieces or a lot of other people involved. And, you know, you need to write, you need to write it all out. You need to write it until it's all there. So people can see your, the full picture of you. So that's that and in a very quick review. Are there any questions about this? I'm just going to stop sharing for the moment so I can see. No other questions? And uh, Rachel, are you going to share some of these? Some uh, P and T. What's that? Wait, chair or share? Chair. Chair. Are you going to share some of these? You said that you will share it in the Google Drive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will. And then there's there's a link there to the Google Drive. If yeah. you don't have access to it, just kind of ask me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm sure that you know if something comes up later, maybe you can ask. Rachel via email sure. and her email is like yeah. in the invitation uh, list. So I will let's uh, thank Rachel for her time uh, and for all the insights because this has been like really, 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 really great. So yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to add one little tiny thing, um, another little bit of, you know, I feel like theory is so limited in planning to mostly white old dudes and I think so much of your work is amazing theory and I think a lot of us do theory but we just don't we get told we're not really theorists so mm -hmm. I think we need to really tell our story more about our theory yeah. and the way we're thinking about planning and our theories our understanding of how it works yes I mean, your statement was awesome so. oh thanks thank, thank you for was sharing it it was hard to put out there. I mean, I even, I had a conversation with my friend Jane, you know, um, last week and I'm like, I feel so vulnerable. <laughs> like, you know, you, you're putting out the stuff that you did well and the stuff that you didn't do well. And we were talking about, it's like, well, do you, you know, are you supposed to like, should you redact your teaching evals before you share it with everybody? And it's like, no, you know, we just came to the decision. No, you just put it all out there. And if you want to, you just, tell everybody it's got strengths and weaknesses and if you ever want to talk about your own work like I'm happy to 
chat with anybody who wants to. We just have to keep breaking breaking down the the old way. It's yeah. And yeah, we'll overcome it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I like that about like owning, right? Because a lot of this is like, in a way, you're finding your identity through like others um, seen in a different way, right? Yeah, uh, you're, yeah, you're having to, I mean, it really is truly, you're narrating your career, but you're the one who's in position to really know and be passionate about your career. So you, you want to ultimately, you want to use other people and other resources around you to help you, but you get, to, this is your story, you know, and it's important to have it out there. And, um, and you can call it theory if you want, even though some, <laughs> whoever doesn't, oh, yeah. reviewer, reviewer number five, apparently oh isn't going to let me do that. So, uh, well. But, Good. Thank you so much again, um, Rachel. So for next time, um, Daryl, uh, he R Ramsey, he's like a UMass, and he volunteered to talk to us about um, teaching, in particular. So that will be like in two weeks at this time. I probably will ask Daryl if we can extend a little bit of the time and see. It seems like an hour and a half is more appropriate. <laughs> mm -hmm. for, I think it is. Yeah, for I think it is. Um, um, then the idea of like getting Jane, I think it's like very good. Maybe mm -hmm. like an activist scholar um, mm -hmm. conversation and how to frame everything within that uh, frame. Yeah. Um, I think it's very pertinent for a lot of people that are here. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think sh I think hers would be helpful. And it's just it's you know Jane was a year ahead of me in her pro process, and I've known her since Berkeley, since ma the master's program. It, it helps to be to know who you're going through it with right so and Aid's going soon and then you know like Evis you're you and April Nicola are all gonna go next out of this group it sounds like it's helpful to share to just have friends in the process and to share back and forth so again thank you so yeah. much <laughs> all right all right thank you see well, you all you next all. time have okay a take care <laughs> thanks Bye. you too Bye, everybody. Bye.